Well, good morning, Bridgeway. We're in this messy series where we've been talking about what it looks like to dive into characteristics of people that we live with or people around us when their life gets a little bit messy. And we naturally, I think we as people, we tend to, uh, this is perfect for this timing, I guess, but we tend to socially distance ourselves uh, in a lot of ways from people who kind of have a messy situation going on in their life. And what I love about this series is looking into how Jesus always takes a step toward the mess. No matter who it was or what the mess was, it could have been a leper and Jesus stepped toward the mess, an adulterer and Jesus stepped toward the mess, the outcast and excommunicated. You could probably guess that Jesus stepped towards those people. And so I've loved this series going through this uh, together because it's been good to be reminded of how Jesus lived his life and how he calls us to live in a similar fashion. And so today, I get to talk about a a particular topic that I find fascinating. But in order for us to get on the same page with today's topic uh, and how we deal with it in ourselves and in other people, I came to the conclusion that first, we have to address the mess within ourselves before looking at other people as well. And so today, we're we're discussing the topic of lying. And I know, I know when I say that, some of you are sitting out there already thinking to yourselves, oh, perfect, because I don't do that ever. And if you thought that to yourself, you might be lying to yourself. And so we're going to jump into that here today. Uh, But if you were sitting there thinking that, and you're actually right, as in you don't find yourself struggling with lying on a consistent basis, Uh, then I hope you hear the principles, the biblical principles that we're going to talk about this morning so that you can catch them and apply them to the ways that you treat all the people around you who maybe are struggling with this topic. And so we're going to jump right in. We're going to dive in today. But I think in order to start off on the right foot, I I believe we have to establish something integral to the conversation. And that thing is this. We live in a culture of lying, don't we? We live in a culture of lying. Do you realize that you, we, us, like we are lied to every single day? You you don't have to look any further than products and brands. Am I right? Because every product, every brand has a slogan or a tagline. And I don't know if you've realized it or not, but some of those slogans and taglines, they're lying to us. And so bear with me for a second. I want to jump into a few of these really famous ones that some of you in here will probably know. And I want to deconstruct them. Here's the first brand that lies to us with their slogan. It's it's M&M's. How many of you, raise your hand in here if you've ever had an M&M in your entire life. Right? All of us. So here's the deal. If you know M&M's and you know their slogan is, and say it with me, M&M's melts in your mouth. But if you've had M&M's, You know all you got to do is get one handful, close your fingers over the top of your palm and hold it there for about 10 to 15 seconds, and your hand ends up looking like this, which means M&M's is lying to us with their slogan. We live in a culture. We hear it every single day. Okay, if if M&M's isn't your thing, uh, then maybe it's Disney. Do you know that Disneyland, do you know what Disneyland's slogan is? It's the happiest place on earth. On earth, the entire earth, they're claiming they're the happiest place. Well, I, I could try to deconstruct this one for you, uh, but a guy named Jim, Jim Gaffigan has already done it really, really well, so I'm just going to listen to him and how he explains it. Last summer, we did our first big family vacation. Well, I should clarify, we went to Disney. Now, if you haven't been to Disney as an adult, just imagine you're standing in line at the DMV, <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> Actually, it was Orlando in July, so it was kind of like standing in line on the surface of the sun. (laughs) Why would we do this to ourselves? (laughs) Remember when you were a kid and you'd go on vacation, you'd be like, why is dad always in a bad mood? (laughs) Now I understand. How can I spend an enormous amount of money, be uncomfortable, and listen to my children complain and whine? Disney. So true, right? Like Disney has been lying to us, the happiest place on earth. And then if, if you even go beyond that, I'll give you one more. Uh, that as a kid, this just this product meant so much to me. Uh, it's this cereal called Trix. And I don't I don't know if you've ever eaten Trix or you know Trix, but their slogan is Trix 
are for kids. But have you ever looked at the sugar content on that box? Like, tricks are for kids, and the sugar's, like, so stinking high. Here's what I propose. We shouldn't be giving kids these. Tricks are actually for adults, like you and me. And so we should be less tricks for the kids, more tricks for the adults, okay? That's what I'm saying. So I need more tricks in my life. At least that's my life slogan. But here's the, here's the deal. Joking aside, I believe that we not only, we not only have found that lying is a, a characteristic of our culture, but I believe we find that it's played an important role in humanity since the beginning of our existence. And so I want to jump into a, a story from Scripture that pretty much most of us in here have probably heard before, if not multiple times. Uh, and I'm going to set the scene. So God has created the earth, and decides to create man, and he creates Adam. And Adam is to care for and watch over the earth. But God decides that Adam, it's, it's not good for Adam to be alone, and so he creates woman and Eve. And so Adam and Eve are tending to the earth when along one day comes a serpent. Now God has told Adam and Eve that they, should, that they could eat from any tree in the Garden of Eden. They could eat any fruit except for the tree right in the center of the Garden of Eden because if they eat that, they will die. And so they stay away from it, but one day Eve has a conversation with the serpent. And this is where I want to dive into Scripture. This comes from Genesis 3, verses 2 through 5. And this is how it starts. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. Why? Because the serpent said to Eve, the serpent goes, hey, is this, is this stuff that God's saying about you guys not being able to eat any fruit in the garden? Is that true? And this is what Eve is responding with. We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And right there, starting off, I think we have to acknowledge something. We have to know and acknowledge that the enemy uses lying, that lying is used by the enemy as a way to separate humanity and God. We see it right then and there. Later on in Scripture, it tells us that the serpent is Satan incarnate himself. And so the enemy uses lying to separate us from God, first by being lied to, and then by tempting us to rationalize and justify lying ourselves. But the fact of the matter is this. Every one of us in here can typically admit that lying is not a good thing. Like, we know this already, don't we? Like, lying is not good. We know lying's not moral. It's not ethical. It's not life-giving. And yet, sometimes we still find ourselves in situations where even though we know it's not good, we're tempted to lie. So the question I want to ask this morning is why? Why do we find ourselves still in situations where we're tempted to lie when we know that lying is not good for us or our souls? I believe it's this. I believe it's because we as humans use lying as our defense mechanism against our own brokenness. And here's just a few. I want to dive into a few reasons that, that I have found that supports the idea of lying being our defense mechanism to our brokenness. And I pull these from the story of Genesis that we just read, from you know, the fall uh, of humanity, but I also pull this from other stories in Scripture and my own life experiences as well. And so here's the first one, the first reason why I think we still find ourselves tempted to lie even though we know it's not good. It's because lying comes from our desire for self-preservation. Lying comes from our desire for self-preservation, which means this. That means that we don't trust God's plan for our lives. Or at the very least, we think we know a better outcome. And we end up falling into survival mode where we protect ourselves and our self-interests at all costs. Because we believe, we believe that that's what's best for us. And who would know what's best for me better than me? And, and this idea, this, this way of thinking, it goes way back to the start of our lives to when we were kids. How many of you in here can remember 
a time where you ever pointed at your sibling and said to your parents, they made me do it. Or if not your sibling, you pointed to a classmate and said to your teacher, he made me do it, she made me do it. A lot of us can think back to a time where we have done that as a child, and yet that is something that sometimes doesn't stay in our childhood. And it can follow us into adulthood as well. We see multiple stories in Scripture that that show this. We can think even when God comes into the Garden of Eden and is looking for Adam and Eve, and when God finds out that they've eaten the forbidden fruit, what's the first thing out of Adam's mouth? He blames Eve and God by saying, the woman you put me here with did this. She made me do it. And then even beyond that, we can even think to other stories in Scripture. We can think to Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, that when, when Jesus is being led away to the house of a high priest right before his trial and crucifixion, and there's crowds gathering around, they know that this is coming, and yet somebody notices, a woman notices Peter in the crowd and says, hey, weren't you a part of Jesus' crowd? And Peter goes, I, no, not me, you've got the wrong person. Not only does, that, does he do that once, but he does it twice. And not only twice, but three times Peter denies knowing Jesus. He lies. Throws the blame elsewhere. I think sometimes, I believe, sometimes we find ourselves still shirking the blame because like kids, we'd rather preserve our own life or our own reputation. And so we lie. Sometimes we find ourselves lying because... We're trying to self-preserve. Here's the second one that sticks out to me. Lying is our way of controlling the narrative. Lying is our way of controlling the narrative. A few years back, uh, I was a youth pastor at a church in Battle Creek. And if you don't know this about youth ministry, I'll just give it to you straight. Uh, Dodgeball is a super big deal when it comes to youth group. Uh, always has been, always will be. I know that there are youth groups uh, that existed in the 1970s that were playing dodgeball. I'm telling you, the students today are just as passionate about it today as they were back then. And so dodgeball is a big deal, especially for youth pastors. Because I remember playing a game of dodgeball with my students. And as I look across the court, I see a kid on the other team that was talking during my entire sermon that night. And I see an opportunity. <laughs> as a youth pastor, I'm like, ah, there he is. I, I have to go for him. So I pick up the dodgeball. I felt pretty confident in my arm. I played third base in high school, so I'm like, I'm going to put a little extra on this because this kid was talking during my message, and I throw it decently hard across the court. And as I, as I watch the ball leave my hand, I also see that the ball careens to the right, right past the student. I'm like, ah, I missed. But right as the ball careens past the student, I also watch as our 85-year-old check-in volunteer lady named Darlene walks into the gym. And I slowly, I feel like it's in slow-mo, as I think about it, I watch the ball zip right by the student and, and hit Darlene right between the eyes. And as it almost knocks her off balance, I see one foot go up, I'm like, Jesus! And... She comes back down, and somebody helps her off the court to a seat, and I run over. And, and, I, and I get down next to Darlene. I'm like, Darlene, what's your name? Tell me your middle name. Are you concussed. You know, I'm worried. And then something happened. I said something that I didn't even think about. It just naturally came out of me. I said, Darlene, I saw it happen. I think one of the students on the other side threw the ball at you. And I'm not proud, but I look back at that moment, and I go, What? How did that naturally come out of me? I, I, couldn't, I couldn't even face the fact that Darlene might know that I threw the ball. So I blamed it on another student. You see, we, when we start to lose control of a situation, lying becomes an enticing pathway. You see, it's, it's tempting to spin a story a certain way to fit an agenda that benefits ourselves. That's what I was doing in that moment. And that, my friends... Is called selfishness. And selfishness walks hand in hand with lying. You see, when something happens that's beyond your control, do you get desperate? 
one of my mentors in life always said this phrase, and it's not exactly grammatically correct, uh, but it's a phrase that's always stuck with me. And he said, desperate does dumb. Desperate does dumb. Which in essence means when we find ourselves in a desperate situation where life is all of a sudden not in our control anymore, we are more likely to make a dumb decision like lying and trying to control the narrative because we like control. Lying is our way of controlling the narrative. And then lastly, this this third point that stuck out to me from Scripture is ultimately ultimately that lying is the utmost form of manipulating people. See, we use lying as a tactic to get people do to do what we want, to say what we want, to believe what we want them to believe. And it comes with a hidden agenda, doesn't it? The serpent did it in Genesis and the story of the fall and the conversation between Eve and the serpent. And you see, this was done by the serpent with evil intent, with evil motives. You see, our culture gets so wrapped up sometimes in self-love that I think, I think we do so at the expense of treading on others with selfish tactics. And yet when Jesus was asked by a religious leader, what is the greatest commandment a religious person can follow, Jesus replies with, love God and love others. Love God and love others. But what happens when we lie is that we try to cover up the brokenness within ourselves. We try to hide from our own failures or misdeeds instead of owning them and being accountable to God with them by laying him, laying them at his feet. We believe the lie that we can handle things on our own, that we don't need God and or we don't need others. And then, and then telling lies becomes the pathway that we choose when we feel we have no other way out from the world seeing our own brokenness. And yet in Luke chapter 8, verse 17, Jesus says something profound. He says this, For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed, and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. I don't, I don't believe Jesus said that to scare people. I believe Jesus said that to, to liberate people. Because there's nothing to hide when it comes to a life chasing after Jesus. And then again, Jesus says in John 14, verse 6, he says this. A lot of us know this. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I think he said truth for a reason because we are, again, we're, we live in a world where lies just come at us from every single angle. We're tempted to throw one back out ourselves. I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I, I believe we can feel pigeonholed into a pathway of lying because we think the alternative will ruin us. We think that telling the truth about ourselves, about our brokenness, will ruin us. But it won't. It will reshape us into the creation that he made us to be. And it won't be easy, but I want you to hear this this morning. It won't be easy telling the truth about your own brokenness, but it will be freeing. You see, Jesus is the antithesis to whatever brokenness we're trying to cover up with our lying. Jesus is the antithesis to that. In a lot of ways, lying can be the byproduct of something else that's going on in our lives. And a lot of us know that. So we've got to fight the temptation to lie by bringing the root source to God and laying the root source at God's feet and saying, this is yours. I can't continue living a lie through this. You see, here's a, here's a part where I come, it comes full circle and we discuss how to deal with others. Because first I want to discuss how we deal with it in ourselves. And so how do we, okay, if, if we deal with it in ourselves by laying our lies at the foot of the cross, how do we deal with it in other people? Well, I, I, think, I think we do this. It sounds simple, but it's not. And it's this. I think we have to love other people through their lying. 
We have to love them through their lying. And this means a few things. It means not giving up on others, but it also means calling them out when you've caught them in the middle of their lie. I, I believe that's a super important dynamic of the word friendship. It's being accountable for each other. Being accountable to each other. It also means not enabling them. Not letting, right? Not letting it just slip by. Not putting them in situations where the lies can just keep on coming. I think that's how we deal. I think that's what loving people through their lying looks like. You see, again, a couple years ago, I think back, I had a student in Battle Creek who started coming to youth group. His, his family didn't come to church. He didn't come to church, but he showed up at youth group one night, and he started coming every single week. And as we got to know him better, uh, he, we got to hear him tell his story, and we started pouring into this kid, uh, and just we just saw greatness in him. And the more we got to learn his story, the, the more we learned that he just perpetually lied about anything and everything. That he'd say this thing happened and, and we'd find out the truth was completely the opposite. Or he'd say he was going to do this thing and be here and he'd never show or he'd never do that thing. He'd never follow through. And it got really frustrating. It was like, what's wrong with this guy? Like, we're pouring into him. Like, we accept him regardless of the fact that he's lying to us. He doesn't have to lie to us to get us to love and accept him. We already did that. We already do that. Why does he continue to lie to us? And I remember taking him home one time. First time I ever took him home, I go to drop him off, and, and he tells me where to drop him off, and he tells me he needs to be dropped off at his grandparents. So I drop him off, and as we're sitting in the driveway, he starts to tell me, I'm like, I'm like hey, do you live with your grandparents? He, yeah. He tells me why, and he tells me the story of his, of his dad just walking out on it on their family and wanting nothing to do with him. He tells me the story of his mom just getting fed up with him and kicking him out of the house. So he had to go live with his grandparents. And all of a sudden it started to click and I and I double checked those stories with with his family, with his grandparents. And they, it's, yeah, that's what happened. And all of a sudden it clicked. It, it just made sense in my head that this kid was lying perpetually. Because he was seeking the attention from somebody else, anybody else, that he wasn't getting from his mom and his dad. See, I say this to our students here at Bridgeway all the time because I wholehearted, wholeheartedly believe it. There's always a why behind the what. There's always a backstory that explains the forestory. And you see, even in our brokenness, we have a God who still loves us and sees the whole picture of us. The whole picture of us, not just a piece of us, not the broken piece, but he sees the whole picture. And then I believe that we see in scripture that we're called to seek out the whole picture in others as well. Not just a piece of it, but the whole picture. And that's how we love them through the lying. We get to know their life context and we speak. We get to speak God's truth into them. And I love that about God. I love that God sees the whole picture of us. That he doesn't just see the broken pieces, the shattered pieces, but he sees all of us. That's, that's powerful to me. And so in this moment, I'm going to invite our worship band back up to the stage. They're going to lead us in worship as we wrap up this service. But as they, as they do, as they head up here, I want, I want to wrap up with this. That even though there's moments when we feel like we have to make a way for ourselves, one thing I love about Jesus is that he's already made a way for us. God's already made a way for us by sacrificing his son. You see, Jesus gives us a way out through that sacrifice. He gives, he's already given us that way out. It's already available. But we've got to let his light shine into the darkest parts of our hearts, even the parts we want to cover up with lying. Which means this, it means taking action by fighting for truth, even when that fight puts us in a really tough and difficult spot. Uncomfortable, awkward spot. We got to fight for that truth. And so my, my prayer is this, is that today that you will let Jesus make your way. Because he already has. 
that you will look for opportunities to speak truth and God's truth into the lives of other people who are struggling with lying, who are struggling with covering up their darkest parts of their lives. And so I, I, I do, I think of Jesus walking towards the mess. I think of Jesus walking towards my mess. My prayer to this morning is that you will let Jesus walk towards your mess. He's already, he's already doing it, but you, sometimes we try to stop him from doing it. My prayer is that you just give up and let him walk towards you, take a step towards you. And then in doing so, when you've, when you've experienced that freedom that comes with that, I think naturally from there, what follows is us walking towards the mess in others. So that's my prayer and my question this morning. Will you let Jesus walk towards you this morning? Dive into your life and clean up the mess. Church, will you pray with me this morning? Father God, we just, we just come to you grateful. Grateful for who you are. Grateful for the fact that you would do that for us. God, the fact that you... You sent your son to the cross even though you knew we'd still mess up, even though you knew we'd still lie, even though you knew we'd still run from you. God, you still did that for us. That, that is freedom. There's freedom in that. And so, God, my prayer this morning is that we recognize that, we live in that, and, God, we celebrate that. That's something to be celebrated, not lamented. And so, God, we lift that up to you this morning just celebrating who you are, that you would do that for us and that, God, that that would change us and transform us in the ways that we treat other people around us. God, will you, will you open our eyes so that we no longer see the mess in other people? But, God, we see you in them. God, I pray that over our church. Man, we love you this morning. We love you every day. We chase after you with our life. God, because you do, you have, you've set that path. You've lit and illuminated it before us. So God, we walk towards you this morning. We stand up and walk towards you this morning in celebration of who you are. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Could they stand with us?